this morning our guest is a journalist, political analyst, presidential historian, and author of the book Lincoln and the Fight for Peace, which is at the back uh, of the room there. As we have just entered the fervor of an election year, this afternoon, not this morning, we are going to be exploring Abraham Lincoln's legacy of leadership during tumultuous times and maybe drawing some parallels to our contemporary challenges. I am thrilled to welcome Mr. John Avalon today. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you all. It, it is really an honor uh, to be here uh, at Fifth Avenue Presbyterian. This is such a legendary congregation. Uh, and uh, I appreciate enormously that you all show up and practice what you preach uh, and have a chance to talk about Lincoln and faith. And I want to thank also Reverend Candace Whitman, who helped make this possible, uh, um, because I think this intersection of Lincoln and faith is, is a really rich vein uh, to discuss, so I'm honored to be here to discuss with you. Mm, thank you, and definitely thank you, Reverend Whitman. Thank you so much. Can you just tell us just a little bit about how this time frame, particular time frame of Abraham Lincoln's life came to interest you? And then a uh, follow up, how, how it led to this book? Sure. So just to, this book focuses on the last six weeks of Lincoln's life, um, which is, uh, it be begins in, uh, with the second inaugural address. Uh, so that's March 4th, 1865. Uh, and he's assassinated, you know, really five weeks and change later. But there are enormously e eventful weeks in the history of our country. I mean, you know, the history is on a hinge at this moment. Um, and then I trace the afterlife of the idea, um, expressed, I think, quintessentially in the final paragraph of the second inaugural address, uh, which we all know. The speech is deeper than that. It's, uh, it, it's, it's only 700 words, but he manages to quote the Bible four times. Um, it's the most religious address given by an American president. And it's largely an Old Testament speech. Um, it's about the war as being, in effect, God's punishment for the original sin of slavery. And that no one person, even the president, could say when it would end. But Lincoln's determination was, and by this point he knew the North would win. But he, he was doing a number of things in this speech. He was trying to reunite the nation. He was trying to provide a roadmap to reconciliation. He was trying to make sure that the scourge of slavery was put behind us forever. And in, fact had just passed the 13th Amendment uh, as dramatized in the, the movie Lincoln, which manages to make a movie about passing a constitutional amendment incredibly compelling, which is harder to do than it sounds, I imagine. Uh, but, um, you know, that, that final paragraph is, is a sharp turn from Old Testament, you know, we are suffering God's judgment uh, to New Testament leadership. Um, in which he says, you know, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right. Um, let us strive forth to finish the work we are in, to bind the nation's wounds, to look after he who has borne the, the battle, to care for his widow and orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and a lasting peace among ourselves and all nations. That is a beautiful summation of, of I think, the spiritual dimension of Lincoln about his understanding that you need to win the peace or you don't really win the war. Uh, providing guidance of, of how to do that and offering the promise of of new life for the nation after so much death he is is such a um, in these last weeks of his life is really operating at the pinnacle of his powers and it's incredibly compelling and what i tried to do was tell a story about lincoln that hadn't been told in that same way before which i will say uh is is i think there have been sixteen thousand books written about lincoln um but but there hadn't been a book focused on his vision of of winning the peace, Lincoln the peacemaker, because he is assassinated just days after Appomattox. Um, so delving into that, I think he really reveals his character uh, and how he was drawing on his faith, which had really evolved and deepened over the course of his presidency, particularly after the death of his son Willie. And then how those ideas ended up being vindicated uh, e even decades later, I think in powerful ways. How did you get interested in Abraham Lincoln? Was that something you'd always been interested in? Um, I think my grandfather um, and, uh, and, and that legacy. My, my grandparents were immigrants. And you know, like a lot of immigrant families, they're very patriotic. Uh, my grandfather came through Ellis Island, served in World War II. Uh, and, and, and for him, sort of the iconic figures of American history, particularly, and he lived in, in the Midwest in Ohio, were very real, very present. 
You know, it was the homespun wisdom that Lincoln offered uh, that was really that made him really accessible, right? It was the aphorisms, it was the stories, it was the jokes, um, and and that he just had this sort of backwoods common sense. Um, and I think there's a really important thing we're in danger of losing right now, which is part of the project of of my books and other people are engaged in this too. But you know, there used to be a concept called civic religion. And I, I want to emphasize how dramatically different that is from any conceptions of Christian nationalism. Uh, civic religion is not about imposing religion on the nation in a firm way that is ideological and constrictive. Civic religion is about saying that we have to exist under a firmament that is shared. Um, and that as the only nation in the history of the world founded on an idea rather than a tribal identity, we are uniquely dependent on unifying stories. And those stories should have something to do with virtue and morality, things that people can aspire to and, and learn from and apply in their own lives. Sometimes I call this, these American parables. Um, and they should be part of our conversation. And part of the project, I think, of every generation is to make these old stories new again. That's something that the play Hamilton does so brilliantly and I think importantly. Um, and I think because we depend on these unifying stories, when one of the things American history teaches us, and certainly the story of the Civil War, is that uh, tribalism tends to short circuit our society. Because we are based, at the end of the day, on transcending tribalism. That's the American project. And so it's incredibly, you know, when people come up with tribal appeals that divide in order to conquer, they can find adherence, and it short circuits our best self for a time. I think we're in one of those times now. Um, but that's why it's also important to study history and apply the lessons of history to try to figure out how to reunite. And one of the things I think is um, that, that, that moral humility that's consistent with a concept of civic religion, looking for unifying stories that celebrate you know, the building blocks of you know, imperfect people trying to form a more perfect union. Uh, but it was my grandfather. And then I think the, the childhood books about Lincoln and other presidents that I was read to as a child um, that created a sense of that there's wisdom to be taken from these people. And it's accessible. And it's interesting. And it's more interesting to understand them as, as flawed humans than to put them up on a pedestal up here where they're inaccessible. Um, and that's part of the project of, of this book and, and I, I hope all my books. Awesome. Wonderful. So, so my first introduction to your book um, was through Reverend Whitman, and she had read your book, and also um, this book by our senior pastor, Elusive Grace, and the subtitle of, of Scott's They're now being sold book. as a package. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you know, that would have been a good idea. I didn't think of it, sorry. <laughs> um, but uh, the subtitle of Scott's book, Loving Your Enemies While Striving for God's Grace, I think is something that I've also heard in your book. Um, that Lincoln, that that was something that Lincoln really um, was also working with. Are there parts in your book that you think that this, this loving your enemies while striving for God's justice? I, 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 I think very, very much so. I mean, both books, I think, are about the end of the day about grace and about the transformative power of grace. Um, you know, one of the, if you, if you ask me to distill uh, Lincoln's prescription for winning a peace after winning a war, um, you know, I think his basic formula was unconditional surrender followed by a magnanimous peace. You need to have both. Um, and after I published the book and I was talking to some folks in Long Island, one more insightful person than I, I am said, well, unconditional surrender and magnan magnanimous peace, that's the, the prime conditions for grace, isn't it? And I'll say, yes, it is. Uh, but it's, of course, applied you know, to issues of war and peace, domestic and geopolitics. What I think is so transformative, and, and the reason we keep returning to Lincoln has to do with this. Um, he practices, because the politics don't neatly translate across the centuries. Words mean different things. Political party labels mean the exact opposite. The Republican Party was a startup third party. It was a moderate progressive party. It was a big tent party designed to stop the spread of slavery. And uh, the Democratic Party at the time had been largely the establishment historically, but also was uh, a, a, a you know, populist conservative party trying to conserve slavery. Um, but you know, Lincoln's 
politics, I think if you really distill it, I, I describe as being the politics of the golden rule. Um, and it's just as sort of difficult and complex as that. Treat other people as you'd like to be treated, right? I mean, it's, it's all there in you know, Matthew 5. You know, this is, this is, this is the heart of it all. And, and Lincoln took great pains to do that, even and most impressively in the midst of a civil war. I mean, I think his defining characteristics are empathy, uh, you know, humor, humility. Um, but the fact he's able to keep empathizing with his opponents, and there are lots of examples of this, it, it, it really is quite extraordinary. I mean, he says about the South, he said, I'm not anti-South, I'm anti-slavery. Then he says, they are just what we would be if we were in their position. Right? He has the moral imagination to put himself in other people's positions. One of the arguments he makes is that, you know, if we end slavery, we'll all be free, right? He's, you know, he, he, he uses arguments that may seem self-evident today, but he said about the debates over slavery, some of which people use biblical arguments to argue for the slavery's perpetuation. He said, you know, I, I never knew a good thing which any man didn't want for himself. Um, and, and, and but so he uses, he uses humor, but he, it, it's really about empathy and he, he sends very strict orders. You know, if you're, if you're representing the government, uh, as an ambassador abroad, don't demonize our misbegotten brethren. We're going to find a way to reunite. He keeps saying, you know, th this is a family feud. We're going to find a way to reason and, and live together again. And he sends that example in word and deed over and over again. Um, th there are moments of real grace, um, one is uh, he's, he's touring the largest battlefield hospital. This is towards, he, he spends around two weeks of the last weeks of his life at, at, the, at the battlefront. Um, and he's going through one of the largest battlefield hospitals in the war. And he's doing what presidents do on to this day. They go to Walter Reed, they meet the soldiers, they talk to them, the, the wounded soldiers. And there are over a thousand men lying in cots and he, he does that. And he's a very emotional guy, Lincoln. He's very, he's, he's really, you know, he is a man of peace in a time of war. He is, he's a very kind man. He's, he's very emotional. He gets teared up easily. It's one of the sort of sweet things about him. It's one of the things I actually like most about him is that he reminds us that kindness can be consistent with effective leadership. That is the most revolutionary thing about him to me. Uh, but he goes around and he introduces himself and he's getting ready to leave and he sees a smaller tent out back and he asks the doctor, he's walking with, what's that? I said, oh, you don't need to worry about that. You don't need to go there. Those are just wounded rebel soldiers. And Lincoln says, that's exactly where I do need to go. And he goes there, and he does the same thing. And there's a testimony from a Kentucky colonel. You know, he says, you know, Lincoln goes, I hope you won't refuse me your hand. He said, do you know who you offer a hand to? Kentucky colonel has been trying his best to defeat you, you know, for the last three years. And, uh, and, 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 Lincoln reaches out, he returns the hand, and, and, and years later, the, 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 this gentleman remembers, you know, I looked in his eyes, and I saw that he was a kind man. And he'd been told that he was a tyrant and a butcher and bloodthirsty, and he said, at that moment, I knew I was whipped. So that, that, that risk of reaching out, that offering of grace reciprocated can really lay the seeds of peace, and that's what I think Lincoln's example does, and it's one of the reasons he's so revered to this day. I know you've said you know the golden rule, and that's that's one of those those teachings that Lincoln really um, put into play. I, I know you also mentioned that you know other aspects of of, um, of Jesus's life where you saw Lincoln setting that example. Can you give us a maybe an example sure. of that? L Lincoln's faith, like like a lot of I, I previously wrote a book about Washington's farewell address. Um, these are not people of orthodox faith, but their faith is profound, and there are certain moments. For example, Washington's letter to the Hebrew congregation in Newport, Rhode Island is one of the great definitive statements of American religious freedom and principles um, that you'll ever find. It's beautifully, beautifully written. Uh, Lincoln was sort of what's known as a youthful free thinker, right? He, 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 he didn't, you know, he, he attended the New York uh, Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C., but he wasn't a member of any particular denomination. But his faith deepened in the course of the White House. The burdens of the war, the death of his son, Willie, um, in the White House. Um, there, there are anecdotes about him uh, going in, in, in troubled times, going and reading the book of Job for comfort and, and emerging oddly cheerful. Uh, it's true. And, and I think what that was about is, is even if it feels like 
God has no plan. God has a plan. All right? Um, uh, but, but with regard to the example of Jesus, his favorite biblical quote is, judge not lest we be judged. Right? So, I mean, there too is the empathy. It's the don't, you know, he's very careful. Don't, don't hate. Find a way to love your enemies. Don't hate them. Um, and exhibiting that over and over again. Um, I, I do think at the end of the day, it's this sort of focus on grace, on mercy, on empathy, on finding a way to love your enemies, on meeting, frankly, just it's as simple and difficult as this, meeting hate with love, and the ultimately disarming capacity of that. That ultimately is the heart of Christianity. That is the most difficult thing. Um, even empathy itself to your enemies is difficult. We live in a time where empathy is strained. Um, and it's difficult in times when people are making Um, we're debating facts um, that are offered in either malice or ignorance, right? Bad faith. That, that strains empathy. And yet, ultimately, we're called upon to find a way to find common ground, to find a way to heal, and that requires maintaining empathy. But Lincoln was able to do it in a time and a place that people were he was fighting with were actively trying to kill him and not only destroy the nation. He managed to summon that. And I, I think the, the, the Christ-like example he sets, and sometimes I, I think he is the Jesus of American politics uh, and being a New Testament leader and somebody who does meet hate with love, someone who focuses on how to heal, not divide, right? I think the, the essence of reconciling leadership is um, it's appealing to people on an elevated sense of their common humanity. The opposite of that is the demagogue who seeks to divide in order to conquer who does the really easy way to achieve political power, which is to say us against them, right? That's the oldest trick in the book. Reconciling leadership, I think rooted in, in Christian principles, but not only Christian principles, um, uh, because the golden rule is actually a universal concept found in, you know, in the Talmud, in the Quran, in the Bhagavad Gita. Some articulation of the golden rule is found in every major religion. Um, but I think that you know when you when you General Sherman had a great uh, summation of Lincoln, he said he he was uh, the kindest of the great men, um, and the basically he combined goodness with greatness more than any man he'd met with his life, and it's the goodness that I think made people act as his apostles long after his death. It's not just by the way that he's he's shot on Good Friday. Uh, that's not why he's the Jesus of American politics. Uh, it, it, is, it is that he really did exemplify a lot of these teachings and, and that his goodness was the key to his greatness and the people recognized that. And that's the hardest thing. A lot of people can seize greatness. There's Napoleonic greatness. Um, but to do it with, with kindness, to do it on the basis of human decency and trying to model those behaviors, particularly when you're in your position of power and influence, that's, that's profound and it's rare. It's really rare. To do it in the middle of the Civil War is almost superhuman. Thank you. So this isn't a spoiler, I promise. But the end part of the book, uh, you move Lincoln past, dies. Yeah, Lincoln dies, Sorry. unfortunately. <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> Um, and uh, and then and then you <laughs> take our humor where we can find it. <laughs> and then you move on um, to talk about others who have used uh, some of Lincoln's ideas. Um, and some of these same principles in their own leadership. Yeah. Um, can you just, we won't spoil everything, but can you just share one example of one of those sure. leaders? So, sure. I mean, but by the way, I'm, I'm going to do a quick detour to the back question because there's, there's another way that, uh, that's very accessible to everyone that Lincoln uh, learned, from, um, lear learned from Jesus. And that is he spoke in parables. Um, I mean, he wasn't formally educated. Many of our greatest presidents weren't formally educated, by the way. Worth, worth noodling on. Um, but uh, he, he, his books were really, you know, he loved Aesop's fables, Shakespeare, and the Bible. Um, and he spoke in parables. And I think that's a direct lesson from Jesus uh, that people can apply in their own lives. Nothing you have to do with, you know, aspirations to that moral plane, but just it's a, it's a good way of communicating. It's disarming. Humor is very effective as well. That's more Lincoln than Jesus. But um, anyway, uh, no, the, the book, people don't pick up a book about Abraham Lincoln and think it's going to end with the Marshall Plan. It's, it's fair. <laughs> right? um, but where, where the seed of this book came from was a quote I found from a, a, a general named Lucius Clay, 
And how many, how many of you all know that name? Fairly obscure today. He was the American general who oversaw the occupation of Germany after the Second World War, um, uh, the so-called good occupation. Um, and it, it was very effective. Um, he was um, himself a son of the South, born 30 years after the Civil War in Macon, Georgia. And a reporter asked him towards the end of his time in Germany, um, what guided your decisions? And he said, I tried to think what Abraham Lincoln would have done for the South if he had lived. And that was so unexpected and so profound for me that I started tracing that idea back. That was the seed of, of the idea. So you look at Lincoln's sort of invention of reconciling leadership, right? Understanding that especially in a civil war, you need to win the peace or you don't really win the war, All right? You, you can't salt the fields of Carthage. You need to find a way to live together again in a civil war. And so reconciling leadership is predicated upon that kind of reconciliation. It needs to be done with strength. There are political and economic and cultural dimensions of this. Um, you need to deal with the root cause that's caused the war, in this case slavery, and deal with it definitively. Um, uh, and, and then there's a period of persuasion as well as economic reintegration, um, which is rebuilding. Um, but, and that's I think what the United States did very effectively after the Second World War. The creation of NATO, the Marshall Plan, rebuilding our enemies um, that has a practical political benefit, obviously stopping the spread of, of communism uh, at the time. But, but if you look at the leaders who've been affected by Lincoln's reconciling uh, leadership, uh, Mahatma Gandhi was very inspired by Lincoln and wrote uh, several essays about him. Um, uh, Martin Luther King. The unexpected one uh, is, um, is Nelson Mandela. And uh, Nelson Mandela has a, a, a wonderful biographer named John Carlin, who wrote a book called Playing the Enemy, which became the movie Invictus. Um, but is, is a brilliant book about political leadership and reconciliation. Um, but when, when Mandela died, Carlin's obituary for Mandela uh, was called Africa's Lincoln. And, and, and Mandela had quoted Lincoln in several speeches at length. Um, but it was this, I think, the, the, the most basic but the most profound point, that Mandela, like Lincoln, didn't achieve, achieve the, un, the unusual, rare, and difficult feat of uniting a fiercely divided people. But he didn't do that by accumulating political power the, the way it's often accumulated, which is that dividing to conquer, you know, separating people into us and them. Right, that kind of tribal appeal to our politics, which is so deeply dangerous in a democracy, particularly in our democracy. Instead, he elevated the conversation based on, on common humanity and, and, and challenging people to find, to see the common humanity in people they'd been trained to hate, which of course requires extraordinary leadership and empathy and, and the golden rule in action. Um, and I think, you know, that is a, a profound extension of, 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 of Lincoln's leadership. So if you were to continue on the end of this book to today's political sphere, <laughs> where do you see this, these ideas of grace playing a part? Or what, what, why is grace such an important part for, for politicians today? Um, so, Look, we are now in, in the midst, um, the beginning of a general election that could not be more consequential in our history. Um, I will say merely by way of mentioning, not campaigning, that I recently left my job at CNN to run for Congress in New York's first district. Um, I, I think that grace is something that we need to seek and seek out and to try to model and to reach out. I think too much of our politics has been play to the base. Too much of our politics has been about the easy way of accumulating power, which is to do the us against them. Um, and to not reach out and try to appeal to the reasonable edge of the opposition, which can be difficult at times, especially times like ours. But I think that's part of the purpose of using history. This is part of the, the benefits of applying history. Um, we, we can know that we've been through hard times before, in fact, far worse times. We can look at the lessons of the leadership that got us out of those times, 
we can draw on our best traditions, which is one way to reunite the nation, right? To draw a direct continuity with the better angels of our nature, with the greatest leaders who've been able to be uniters in divided times, and to apply that forward, and to reach out and talk to people who maybe feel like they haven't been spoken to. A lot of this is a feedback loop about people feeling judged, right? And it's also the toxic effect of tribalism in our politics. Um, but if you have a conversation that begins predicated upon uh, a shared love for our country and a concern for its future, and, and you can have the initially risky conversation of not simply preaching to the choir, but reaching out, which after all is the essence of evangelism, then I think we can start to build bridges. And, and then that can set forward sort of you know, concentric circles of hope, as I think Bobby Kennedy once said, ripples of hope. It, it, you know, you're not going to be able to win over everybody. But I think if you do approach it, and this is part of Lincoln's great political genius, is combining moral courage with moderation. Not letting you know, a sense of the, the seriousness of the moment slip into self-righteousness. That's not the way to do this. Um, and um, you know, God knows I'll make a million mistakes uh, on, you know, on, on the campaign trail. And, and, but you know, the more we can keep the best examples from our history in our minds, just as citizens, uh, the more we can try to reach out and find a way to heal by on finding common ground based on common facts, which can be a challenge. But the more we can really try to, to model that behavior, the better we'll be for our country in the long run. You know, this is a, a case where we will get through this. We need to all, as citizens, up our game, straighten our civic backbones, kind of get off the sidelines, draw on the best lessons of our history, and then try to build a better politics. Um, and that's gonna be rooted in reconciliation and reasoning together. Uh, and it can't be d based on, on deepening resentments. So th that requires playing a different game. Um, but I think it's the American game. Again, it's rooted in that idea of transcending tribalism. And that's, I think, what we're the challenge now and, and what we're called on to do. And it's difficult to do, especially in the heat of an election. Um, but I think that's something, it's less about the leaders emulating and more about citizens modeling. I think this is a case where citizens need to lead. And not, you know, that's, the, that's part of living in a democracy, right? We can't wait for someone else to come save us. We're citizens, not subjects. It's up to us. And so therefore we have to model the behavior we want to see, however difficult and frustrating that may be. Thank you. Just one last question from me, and then I'm going to open it up to folks uh, both in the room and online um, to ask a few questions, so start thinking. Um, but what would you say is the, is the biggest takeaway for people, you know, as you say, the, the citizens who are modeling this, what would you say is the biggest takeaway from, from Lincoln's life? If Lincoln could maintain his empathy for the quote-unquote other side in the middle of a civil war, where soldiers and troops were actively trying to destroy the Union and kill him, surely we can. You know, um, don't buy into the second Civil War talk. It's an insult to 750,000 Americans who died on both sides of the conflict. But looking at Lincoln's example, particularly in, in his second inaugural, I mean, you know, he's the president of the North in a time of war. But he doesn't talk about North versus South in that speech. He talks about we. He talks about us. Right? He, he, he doesn't, even though he says, the, don't make no mistake, he says, this war is about slavery. But he also doesn't let the North rest easy in a sense of moral superiority. Because we're complicit. Right? We bought the cotton. We bought the rice. And, and, and so that requires a degree of moral humility, especially near a time of victory. And thinking about the, the obligations to reunite again, thinking about what it takes to really win a peace. And you know, make no mistake, you need to win on the battlefield first. There is no substitute for victory. But then is a time for magnanimity. Firmness in dealing with the underlying root causes that led to the war, because if you don't, and Lincoln's brilliant on this, um, it's captured in a scene in the movie, uh, Lincoln, where they're uh, 
on the River Queen, which was the sort of presidential steamship at the time. But Lincoln said, look, no man, basically the, a couple of Southern Confederate uh, uh, cabinet members had come to him talking about peace. And they said, look, we can just have a ceasefire right now. Just, just let's have a ceasefire. And Lincoln said, there can be no ceasefire before surrender. Why? It would be really popular. It would be easy. But Lincoln said, no man desires peace more than I, but I'm unwilling to accept a peace if it's achieved on such conditions that only guarantees more war in the future. You need to deal with the root cause. There needs to be an acceptance of defeat. There needs to be an addressing of the root cause and end to slavery for all time and an exception, the resumption of the Constitution and a renunciation of this so-called right to secession. So th those are, those are the, the broad preconditions. But after that, magnanimity. And that's rooted in the example you know, he, he set. Um, and uh, so there's no substitute for winning. But then it's about modeling behavior that can help reunite and reconcile as a nation, right? You know, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right. Um, to achieve a just and a lasting peace, right? It needs to be lasting. Um, th those are the key principles, it seems to me. Thank you. You know, I really, I hadn't heard that before, the idea, you know, that we bought the cotton. That, that is a powerful image of our complicity in the, uh, interesting. All right. Oh, Emily is moving our microphone. Thank you so much, Emily. Microphone Emily. has been moved. Microphone has been moved right to the center. So those people who are in the center, you're up first. Um, so folks, we're going to spend a little time with some questions. I hope that you've been thinking. I know that some of you, uh, I spoke to some of you who have already had a chance to read this book. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping you've got some questions. Um, as we're preparing for this question and answer time, there is uh, at the end, Ashley will be um, selling some books in the back there um, that you're welcome to, to grab one of those as well. And I also think we have a uh, live stream folks. We do have Natalie uh, who is going to be able to uh, pose your questions to us as well. So please do um, put your questions in the chat there so that we can get some questions from you as well. All right, anyone have any questions? Shy. Yes. Would you mind just come popping up to the microphone for us? We're going to uh, make sure that our live stream folks can hear all of the questions asked. If, if Lincoln had lived, what do you think he would have done differently than what ended up happening? And would it have eased some of the racial tensions that we see today? Uh, yes, I believe so. Um, and, and I think things would have been dramatically different. Um, you know, I, I think that it's sometimes said, and I think accurately understood, that uh, history is about character, right? You know, power doesn't corrupt, power reveals. And um, good stories are about characters and character being revealed. I think we cannot say enough in our own time that uh, character is the single most important quality in a president, indeed in all people. But it comes down to character. We forget what political party a president belonged to over time. We don't forget the evidence of their character. Um, and uh, when you look at Lincoln's character, I think refracted through his personality and his principles and the policies that are expressions of that, and then you contrast that with Andrew Johnson, you start to understand the tragedy of, of Reconstruction. I'll, I'll give you a, a quote from... Uh, the Atlantic um, magazine at the time, Atlantic Monthly, about Andrew Johnson. They described him as being uh, thin-skinned, ill-tempered, egotistic to the point of mental disease. <laughs> um, and this is in contrast with someone who even Lincoln's enemies acknowledged he was honest, <laughs> you know? It couldn't be credibly denied. Honest Abe was his nickname when he was alive. It just wasn't like the thing bestowed on the you know, martyred former president. Um, it comes down to character. And, 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 and Andrew Johnson was driven by resentments. Um, uh, and it's funny because a lot of radical Republicans at the time thought he would be their avenger, 
right? They thought th th there was talk about getting Lincoln out of there because they thought he was going to be too soft on the South in the wake uh, of, of surrender in the Civil War. They thought Johnson, who'd been a war Democrat from the South, would be much tougher. He said, treason must be made odious. They got it wrong. He wasn't a race warrior. He's a class warrior. He was deeply resentful. Uh, and, and that drove his politics. And therefore, he was uniquely susceptible to getting played. But, you know, he pulled black troops out of the South. He gave amnesty, basically blanked in amnesties that occurred for pers in, in exchange for sort of personal appeals. He didn't have the, the steadiness and the steadfastness uh, that Lincoln did. And so it was a disaster. Um, and, and, and tone comes from the top. Uh, and, and Andrew Johnson's uh, utter chaos uh, and, and resentment-driven politics, uh, his, his impulsiveness, uh, all these things are opposite of, of Lincoln's character. And, uh, and, and that ultimately led us to where we are. Now look, I want to be clear. You know, um, Lincoln would have made other mistakes inevitably, but I think he would have gotten the big things right. I mean, I think a great leader steered towards the horizon. You know, for Lincoln, the details are, are negotiable. It's the, it's the great principles that must be inflexible. And, um, but I think, for example, he anticipated the dangers of vacuums of power that would lead to vigilante groups. That's what until ultimately Ulysses S. Grant needed to deal with when he contained the KKK with the Enforcement Acts in the early 1870s, uh, which Ron Chernow discusses brilliantly in his book, Grant, and which is really, and there's a new book about, and is an important moment in our history, particularly dealing with violent militia groups um, and the history of, of those sorts of appeals. Um, but, but when you look at the tragedy of, of Reconstruction and how you can have constitutional amendments that are effectively ignored in practice for, for a century, um, the, the lessons of Reconstruction and how those rights were rolled back in effect using voter suppression, voter intimidation, uh, you know, uh, the, the cloak of states' rights, that's a very urgent tale to understand in our own time. Um, and I think Lincoln would have gotten the big things right. He anticipated a lot of it. And he said, look, it's going to take a while for black and white, this is his phrase, for blacks and whites to live themselves out of their old arrangements with each other. So he didn't think you'd, you'd, you could wave a magic wand. And indeed, he was criticized by abolitionists in his own time for not being radical enough. But I'll give the last word to Frederick Douglass on this, who, who, who was speaking at the dedication. He was the keynote speaker at the dedication of a statue, which is now controversial, which shows Lincoln with a... Um, a slave getting up off the ground, breaking in chains, that was paid for by slave funds and was based on the masthead or the, the image on the Liberator abolitionist newspaper. Uh, Frederick Douglass gave the keynote address with the President of the Supreme Court watching. And he said, look, seen from a genuine abolitionist perspective, Lincoln could seem tardy, cool, and indifferent. But seen from the perspective of a statesman who was bound to consult the sentiments of his fellow citizens, he was zealous, determined, and radical. And I think that's the, the, the right political balance. Um, by the way, I'm just before I forget, there's one other thing you raised about this election and Lincoln's example and all of us. I, I think there is an opportunity in this country, I think there's an obligation in this country, to ensure that no one political party gets to credibly claim the Bible and the American flag. And I think there, there is a real need for uh, people of faith um, who are not on the right to set an example and speak out and, and be part of that. And I think that's one of the hopeful things in our politics is Raphael Warnock, senator who you know, preaches from Ebenezer uh, Baptist Church where Martin Luther King did, um, uh, Joe Biden, to, to, to sort of, you know, who's a person of faith and goes to church regularly. That, that's an important thing to do because that can be a source of common ground. Right now, because it's been polarized and made partisan, faith is used as a political, uh, a divisive weapon when in fact it can be a ground for finding common humanity and erasing some of those self-righteous assumptions that lead to greater divisions. So I think that's a unique opportunity for church-going folks, um, particularly uh, maybe here in New York. What else? Or oh, don't be shy, come on. <laughs> there you go, I shamed you into a question. I appreciate it. And, and I'm in the middle too, by the way. <laughs> Good. Uh, is this on? Yep. Yeah. Uh, much of the resentment today, uh, not to make uh, the, the, the fight against diversity less than this, but much of the resentment today seems to be um, against elites. And in my view, it's because of the growing inequality that's mm -hmm. taken place over the last 50 years. If Lincoln were running for president now, how, how would he 
how would he position himself on that? How would he address that? So that, that's a fascinating question, and there are always limits to which I can do the what would Lincoln do, I mean, as a historian. But, but I mean, the entire point of applied history is how can you take what they said and apply it to our times, or at least make sure it's not being misused. You know, one of the reasons I wrote the Washington book, which was in the wake of, of the Tea Party, was I was seeing all these misappropriation of the founding fathers into making them into like, hyper-partisan polarizing figures when the entire point of whether you read the Federalist Papers or Washington's Farewell Address, they're explicitly warning against the dangers of hyper-partisanship and polarization, saying that that's dangerous to democracy, let alone, I mean, not encouraging it, which is how they were being misused at the time. That's why I say it's important to understand that the Republican Party was an upstart third party. It was a moderate progressive party. It was a big tent party designed to stop the spread of slavery, right? And, and Lincoln would say, Look, I'm for both the man and the dollar, but if I have to choose, the man before the dollar, right? Now, the, the Whig party he had come out of was a party, a moderate party of middle class merchants in the Midwest. The alliteration indicates how my brain works. Uh, it's easy to, to remember that, but, it, but it's true. And they, had, they understood there was a proper role for government, right? Lincoln said the proper role for government is to do for people and communities what they cannot do so well for themselves. So build bridges, help stitch together communities. Secure, you know, basic law and order. But within that sphere, people should be able to do their best. Part of the objection to slavery on the part of a lot of early Republicans was that it was, it was free soil and free labor, right? I mean, it was actually anti-capitalist in a pure sense. And that part of what made America work was people could own their own land and work hard and over time make money. <laughs> and, 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 and it's the, the idea of social mobility through opportunity and effort. Um, and, and I do think that that, you know, there's a curse of bigness that can constrict real competition and open competition. So without you know, projecting Lincoln into debates about the economic effects of AI and growing inequality, um, I do think one of the real objections to slavery at the time was it did create massive uh, gaps between rich and poor. And, and, and Lincoln came out of a tradition that was about small businesses, farmers, self-reliance. It was merchants. It was we need to have a vibrant economy because that helps social mobility, which helps people achieve freedom. Um, and, uh, and, and whenever you have a great gap between the rich and the poor, um, that is corrupting, it, it can be, and it also can lead to uh, people putting you know, the dollar before the human, which is a perfectly one of many good ways in a, of looking at the, the evils of slavery, which of course were rationalized at the time. What else? Okay, I'm not, I'll let the awkward science sit until I shame someone to the microphone. Yes, ma'am. I think it'll be better for people at, in the live stream if you go up to the microphone. I'll, I'll bring it. Oh, down. look at that. Look at that service. Come on. Oh, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. What, I, I'm just curious. I mean, when you look back at the time of Lincoln, when when... When uh, conversations took place on a small scale, in immediate live basis, you know, we live in the society we live in now is is so much different. Where ideas are transmitted um, before before people really have what. We're, well, the question I'm asking is, what's the place, is there a place for real conversation? There needs to be, right? I mean, you know, democracy at the end of the day, particularly on its most vibrant local level, is about civic conversation, right? I mean, I think this is one of the things we're in danger of losing, right? I mean, democracy depends on an assumption of goodwill among fellow citizens. That depends upon people reasoning together from a common set of facts. We have access to more information than ever before, and yet we find ourselves balkanized because people are coming to debates armed with their own facts because of, frankly, hyper-partisan media and the fragmentation of media into, and, and algorithms that serve up people, self you know, information that you know, is, is, confirms their own biases. There are some things we can control about that. Um, not control in a heavy top-down way, but we can say that, you know, uh, 
we can establish some guardrails around the free flow of information and the way algorithms serve up things. We are learning things about the way that algorithms draw people in with that sort of, you know, uh, you know weapons of mass distraction uh, that can be directly harmful to people, particularly to children and teenagers. But not only that. Um, I think the, the fragmentation of our, our, our ability to reason together we know it's been gamed, for example, by foreign adversaries. There's a great example in 2016 in Houston, Texas, where um, there was a, a protest outside a mosque um, and then a counter protest to the protesters. And both had been basically ginned up out of whole cloth by people in St. Petersburg, Russia. And that's just one example. But, but the, 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 it's, it's a graphic physical example of what happens on, online all the time. Very often the people who are are trying to seem like the most ideologically pure, you know, warriors are in fact intentionally or unintentionally uh, the, the useful idiots, which is a technical phrase of of hostile foreign entities that want to see America divided and distracted and unable to reason together. Which is only to say we should rally against that in a unified way. I think there is bipartisan concern, for example, about some of the algorithms and their, their impacts and actions, I think, can and should be taken about that. We're going to have a, a vote in the next week or so about uh, TikTok in this country. And so it's, it's, it's a new frontier. Um, look, Washington, you know, Lincoln read newspapers all the time. He, uh, there were partisan newspapers at the time. That, that's not the problem, per se. He was, a secret, he was a silent owner of a German language newspaper, by the way. Uh, he loved new technology. We shouldn't be afraid of new technology. Um, he was obsessed. He would like to hang out in telegraph offices and write his speeches there because that was like the email of his day. He got the fastest information. Um, so it's, it's not about, I think, trying to bring us back to a mythic simpler past, right? It's always seemed to me that, you know, the past seemed simpler because that's when we were children and we were simpler. <laughs> you look back at any time in history, it's fraught with difficulty and challenges. And our time is too, make no mistake. Perhaps not compared to the Civil War. Um, there are larger forces at work that we need to be wide-eyed about. But we do, I think, need to draw on the lessons of history to feel a sense of, to try to view the challenges of the moment with a sense of perspective, to feel empowered uh, to, to, to view those challenges with a sense of clarity as best we can, to draw on the lessons of history and the leaders of history who were able to confront those challenges, and try to be invigorated by that opportunity to impact the future in real time rather than overwhelmed by the challenges we face, which right now I think many folks do feel overwhelmed. Because a lot of it, whether it's climate change or AI, seems overwhelming. Um, and yet, history is very clear that that kind of a posture doesn't help solve problems. Right? You need to enter into the fray with a sense of clarity and confidence and say that this is, this is the hand we've been dealt. We are going to deal with it. And that we are going to try to make sure we're our best selves as a country, return to those principles that do make ourselves our best selves. And, and that's why I think reading history is so valuable. Um, all of which is a long way to say about your question. There's, you know, the form of information and media, you know, there's some genies you can't put back in the bottle. There are things we can do to strengthen guardrails around our democracy. And, and, and some of them are about algorithms and, and information. We should be very clear-eyed about the civic dangers of hyperpartisan media in particular. Um, and, 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 and remembering as citizens, you vote with your eyeballs and your wallets every day, uh, not just with your vote. And, and so you should be rewarding the places that are trying to be counterweights. You're trying, you know, use that power as well as citizens in addition to just showing up. Uh, and making sure that the people who are trying to cynically divide us uh, can't rewrite reality simply by appealing to tribal divides. The danger is, is that those of us in the broad middle of the country uh, s recede from the civic sphere because it looks indecent, it looks difficult, it looks overwhelming. And that, of course, just leaves that ground to all the ideologues and extremists who don't mind this stuff because they're just trying to seize power. So this is a time to kind of lean in uh, as citizens, to strengthen the civic backbone, to feel empowered, to develop you know, positions encourage your representatives to deal with these issues rather than simply fear monger and fundraise off it. Fix it. Where's the common ground? Not perfect, you know, we're not gonna, perfect's never on the menu, but really being clear-eyed about the challenges we face and then feeling confident that we can deal with it. That attitude itself is infectious, it seems to me.
And that's something that we can do as citizens. Anyway, I want to thank you all for your time. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And uh, I hope you enjoy the book. And uh, do what we can to emulate Lincoln in our own lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, for joining us. And also, thank you to Reverend Whitman for even bringing this forward. I do, I know we, I said we have this book at the back for sale. If you haven't read Scott's book also, it, it does pair well. It's like a great pair. So, um, you know, uh, loving your enemies while striving for God's justice really, really fit well with, with John's book. So thank you again, John. Um, he did mention that he would be willing to sign a few books. So if you do purchase one at the back, come on out. Thanks. <laughs>